Considering home security? Consider this. For 140 years, ADT has helped stop more crime than any other home security company. The yard sign isn't just a sign. It's a line in the sand. It's no wonder five times more people choose ADT to protect their homes. Visit ADT.com to learn more. For license information and terms and conditions, visit ADT.com. This is the best of Mike and Mike podcast. Mike podcast. Subscribe now by going to the Listen tab in the ESPN app. The best of Mike and Mike. Here we are. Good morning. We are back in better than ever. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. All our guests today, and there'll be plenty on the Shell Pinto performance line. So here we go to Thursday. And in the waning days of this enterprise, huh, Golik finds himself in a couple of tight spots exclusively of his own making. Saturday, he has a lot, and I mean a lot, riding on his alma mater facing the U. And today, live on this program, the big fella is going to do the one-chip challenge, which you have just taken on yourself. Yeah. Big fella, how you feeling? I, I feel fine. The, for the chip challenge is fine. I'm going to do it. My son's going to do it. Trey Wingo is going to do it. The, so that the new show that will start November 27th, Golik and Wingo. We're going to all do the chip challenge at 945 Eastern, I believe, coming up to the end of this show. Correct. We didn't really want to do it earlier in case there were any adverse In case you effects. were unable to continue. Yeah, you'd be doing the rest of the show alone. I don't think there will be. My thought on that is not a big deal. It's a food challenge. I've done about a bunch of food challenges, so so be it. It'll be hot. I'm sure it'll be hot. I don't expect anything adverse to happen. Maybe I'm underselling because I've seen a lot of the video of people eating this chip, so maybe it'll affect me more than I think. I don't know, but I'm not really worried about the food thing. The the Notre Dame Miami bet got away from me. Yeah, that one got away from me. And all of a sudden, there's massages going on, and 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 I I, I don't like that direction. And and your, you sent it in that. Well, a, a, a tweet, a tweet from did, a tweet. But then you, you magnified it. But I can't even blame you. I'm a grown man. I could say I don't want to do it if I don't want to do it. And and we got Dan on, and we Dan said he got suckered. Dan Lebetard, who went to the U, said he got suckered into it. But I think it was kind of a reverse psychology. I think he really suckered me into it. I don't like how that one went. So. I've been watching Notre Dame this year and really enjoying it. You know, there's no angst of your kids playing and that kind of thing. You know, when there's a little more on, I just sit back and enjoy. Now, all of a sudden, I have angst. All of a sudden, Saturday night, 8 o'clock, I've got angst. Just like I had no angst in the Notre Dame-Northwestern game because I thought we were going to roll you guys. All of a sudden, the second half... I got angst. Yeah. I got a lot of angst, and then I got naked and oiled up and a picture taken of me. Okay? Correct. So I'm going to have angst from now until the end of that game till Notre Dame wins that thing. Quickly, for those of you who don't know what this is, it, it, it's come up just this week here. Yeah. We decided, why won't Golik and Lebetard make a friendly wager? You and Jim Kelly have bet, like, stakes. We bet stakes. I bet uh, Fiegels. I got to wear the turnover. Chad Jeff Fiegels, who went to the U. We played together in Miami as kid punch for Miami. He's got to get me $100 worth of donuts or I have to wear the turnover chain. This was the kind of thing That's the kind of bet we I had in mind. I can, I can wear a turnover chain. I can buy six ribeyes and send them to Jim Kelly. But do I have to massage Stugatz? Yeah, so, or you? <laughs> not me. Yeah. The, 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 the tweet came in. One of the tweets. We decided let's just solicit for fun sure. you know, suggestions from the audience. We had an hour to kill before Lebetard was coming on that day. This was two days ago. And we figured, let's just solicit some suggestions sure, from our audience sure. of what could be the stakes yeah. of a bet. You know Golik, you know Lebetard, obviously. They're two of the best-known uh, personalities of the network. You know the quirks of their own respective personalities. So it would be kind of fun to do. And one person tweets in, the loser should have to massage Stu Gatz. Yeah. Because obviously Stu Gatz is, is Dan Lebetard's cross to bear. Right. And you've sort of, with his closeness to Mikey, you sort of, yeah. you're almost like a father figure. Yes, I am, to Stu Gatz. Stu Gatz is trying to become a part of my family. He wants to get in the will. That's sort of the way it feels. Yeah. He, feel, he feels like he's yep. becoming yep. like a little Agreed. bit of a, of a, of a Golic child. And, 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 and the, so I just read that, and I laughed. And the next thing I know, it happened. I don't even know exactly how it happened. I don't either. We'd have to, we're going to have to go back and retrace exactly how that developed over the course of that hour, because I don't even really remember. But somehow, that's where we landed. We did. So, so the loser of that game, whether it's the U or Notre Dame, it's you or Lebertard, has to give Stu Gatz a massage. And then Lebertard tried to change it by saying, wait a minute, the, the partner on my show and Stu Gatz got involved in this. He's saying, now you should be involved in it. 
And, and there's just no chance of that. It has nothing to do with me. Stu Gatz is but, that guy. But Stu Gatz is, is the Stu guy. Stu is saying he's not part of it either. He oh, didn't go on. to the U. He didn't Stu go to Notre Dame. Stu Gatz lives for this. I agree with that. He's coming on today at 8 yeah. o'clock. I and, agree with and, that. And, and Stu Gatz... The, the, Stu Gatz is the person who gets massaged yeah. when someone loses yeah, a agree. wager. I agree. Right? I agree. That's yeah. who he is. Yeah, he is. But He's so to circle guy. it back to today, we've got the one chip challenge yes, at we the do. end of the show, and we've got a lot of preparation that is required for that. Now, Mikey will be here in a half hour, so we'll get more into that when yeah, you Yeah, yeah, we do, because there has to be some legal things done before we can, uh, you know, eat the chip. If there's one thing that we learned years ago when oh. we wanted to set ourselves on fire, <laughs> yeah. legal has no sense of humor. No, they do not. Tasing and setting on fire were two big no-nos. Yeah, we'll, we'll, t- yeah, we'll, we'll reshare. That. It'll be yeah. a good opportunity yeah, to well. retell some funny old we're stories, share stories top, today. in a little top. bit. But let's start with off the top, Mike, and we'll start with the NBA doubleheader on ESPN last night. It started with the Celtics, the best team in basketball, knocking off the Lakers but suffering another injury along the way. Yeah, they did. We'll, we'll see about uh, Jason Tatum. He had the ankle coming to the end of that game. He left uh, uh, later on in the game, ended up in a walking boot. But the Celtics became the second team in NBA history to win 10, 10 straight games after starting the season 0-2 or worse. The 6 Mavericks won 12 straight after that. Kyrie, Kyrie's handle, they did just a compilation of his handle, of his dishes, of his moves. He, I don't think there's a better guy in the league. I, th- I know we've talked about this before of what he does with the basketball. Uh, so he was fantastic uh, a- again. And the Celtics continue the winning streak. The Lakers and Lonzo Ball, can, he continues the shooting woes. He's, My goodness. Well, I mean, listen. We knew that coming in, and it's not like it was magically going to be fixed. He went from college to the pros and was already not a great shooter, so it's not like we expected it to be better. So it's something at some point that will have to be obviously addressed. He knows it more than anybody else. Uh, not a great game. And what I, one thing I didn't realize, it's his fifth game this year where he didn't get to the free throw line. Did not get to the free throw line. So uh, the start of this rivalry, well, this rivalry is going on forever, but Kyrie and Lonzo Ball, this one goes to Kyrie and the Boston Celtics, who have won 10 in a row. Off the top. Meanwhile, the nightcap last night saw the Warriors knocking off the Timberwolves, and they did it without Kevin Durant. And they're pretty good without Kevin Durant. What are they, 14-0? and 0? Is that what the number is? Uh, without Kevin Durant. They have won 14 straight w- without, without Kevin KD, Durant. Yes. It's pretty pretty amazing. But but what's amazing with them, it's Golden State's 40th game with 35 or more assists under Steve Kerr since 2014. 31 more than any other team. 31 more. They've done it 40 times. The next team is the Hawks have done it nine times. So they dish the ball. Each of their made threes was on an assist in this game. So you talk about the great players and a number of them, and there's only one ball out on the court, but you know what they do? They share. They share that ball, and it shows. They play They play the game of basketball, and then they just add the three-point shot, and it, I mean, it's, it's a wonder to behold. And you always, I always say in sports, when you come out of a halftime or a time when you have some time to go over things, a period in, in, in hockey, whatever, when you can adjust, the Warriors are at their best. In the third quarter of games since the start of last season, they're plus 547 points. 547. They come out and destroy you in the third quarter. Yeah, they're very well coached. You know, here's the interesting thing about Golden State. I, like many people, I think, am naturally inclined to root for the underdog and to root against Goliath. And they're so stacked that I find I'm always rooting against them. The truth is they are a joy to watch. I mean, they are, they are, they I are agree. the best team in the NBA I agree. to watch, which should come as no surprise because they have most of the best players. But they also they don't just ISO those guys. They actually play, which is the point I made a minute right, ago when right. I said they play the game, and I realized I probably sounded like an no, idiot. No, 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 but I, I get you what You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. They're, they're, they're actually playing the game the way it was intended to be played, and now you see what it looks like when you do it with a three-point line and with, like, four of the best players in the world. Off the top. Uh, what top. else? Okay, here we go. Rick Pitino, according to the newly released indictment against an Adidas executive, was aware of the bribery scheme that ultimately cost him his job. They've got wiretaps on this conversation that took place in this hotel room in Las Vegas that make it clear, at least to the words of the people in that room, that Pitino was well aware of what was going See, on. See, again, why, why this to me you know, gives you an uh-oh moment is it's not the NCAA. It's not just the NCAA. The NCAA will at some point, I'm sure, get involved in this. But when you say in the letters FBI to hold different ball game 
And when you're talked about in that, he already doesn't have a job, you know, and we know he's going to try and get his money. What is it, 44 mil yeah. or something it's like over that? over 40 million. That they're yeah. going to fight for. But, you know, this this is, again, his FBI stuff. So that really – it's just like the, 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 uh, the ball kid for UCLA. It's not just, you know – shoplifting it's shoplifting in another country it, right. it kind of like uh oh wait we don't really know these parameters just like you used to an ncaa ve- investigation where you may cost you a suspension or some games this is the fbi it could be could be a right. lot more he's than already that. been fired exactly so that, that the ncaa there. can't do anything more to him except i do well, wonder they do a show cause it, it, well they could give him a show cause i don't think yeah. he's getting another job anyway but i think that if it is shown in some sort of definitive way that he was aware of this, that's going to hurt his getting the $40 million. It's right? going to so hurt his getting the have an impact million. on and, that. And eventually where all this goes with the FBI and who they're really after, who they're really trying to get. Do we know who it uh, is? No, I don't I know. don't. Because I think we asked that from the beginning. Who are they going after? You know how it's you get the kid on, the, you know, the, the guy in the corner, but you don't want him. You want his boss, and then you want his who do we want here? Who does the FBI want here? I, I don't know. I have no idea. We may be starting to find that Off out. The we'll top, see. The uh, top. And speaking well, of that, yeah. continuing in all of this, Bruce Pearl. Yeah. God bless him. We know Bruce. He worked here at ESPN. I like Bruce. I like him very much. I do as well. He's now refusing yeah, to cooperate I, with his own school's internal investigation of what happened here in this scandal that wound up getting one of his assistants, Chuck Person, in probably the most trouble of anybody involved. Yeah, FBI agents has seized. Bruce Pearl's computers and cell phones as part of their investigation. School officials haven't given uh, Pearl a deadline to cooperate, but they basically are saying in the next couple of weeks and your job could be on the line. So the FBI is investigating. The school is doing their own investigation. They say, Coach, we want to talk to you. And he's basically saying, nope, not talking. Can you do that? I, I don't, well, he's doing it. I know. And, and it may, I, listen. I just I, I do everything you think about any business. If something was going on here and the bosses wanted to talk to us and we refused, you could be in jeopardy of losing your job. I would think. So how how far do you want to take this to the point of losing your job? I mean, if, if there's, it isn't even as simple as the boss just wants to talk to you and you refuse oh, to no. take the right, meeting. Right, right. This is like there's a major problem. There's a there there the, the the FBI is yeah, involved yeah. for crying out loud. We want to talk to you. About We're this. conducting an investigation. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, yeah. I got nothing to say. Can't talk. Is that on the Wait, list of me? options? It seemed, for Bruce, it seems to be. I guess it is. <laughs> I, I, I read that story. I had to read it like five times yesterday to make yeah. sure I was getting yeah. it right. He is refusing to cooperate with his own university yeah. Yeah. investigating this and scandal. Again, I don't know all the legal things involved in this. I'm sure there are some things, but but just on its face, it seems very That doesn't odd. sound like a person who's long for this no, job. No, no, it does not. Right? I mean, no, it does the not. Top, Something the else. Top. And then finally, uh, the Packers have cut Martellus Bennett. For failure to disclose a physical condition, now they're most likely going to go after a, a prorated portion of the signing bonus. Basically, half the signing that he bonus. got he over eight mil signing bonus. Did he not? Yeah, I, I think, and they're, they're going, going after, after the four point two million. Uh, yeah, not disclosing an injury. He hasn't played in a bit, and basically announced that this year was probably going to be his last year. He'll go through the waiver system right now, and at some point, I have a story about this. I did it. You did what? I did this. You injured Martellus Bennett? No, I did not. Oh, well, hold on. Let's let's make that off the top. And it's what everyone's talking about. It's brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. What are you talking about? Well, first, real quickly, I know Lonzo Ball. Let me go back to that real quickly. Had good numbers shooting in college. I guess my point should have been what everybody's point was. How will his shooting translate over to the NBA the way he shoots and such? Because his percentage was pretty good shooting. He was he was thought to be a good shooter right, in college. Right. His father was telling us that he was going to be Steph Curry, right, right. in the NBA. But, but let's percentages move past were that. pretty good. I just wanted to. to I, his percentages were pretty good, but it certainly is not translating right now. So the Martellus Bennett. <clears throat> hopefully, there's a uh, statute of limitations on this one, but it doesn't uh, involve as much money. So Martellus Bennett again, failure to disclose. Basically, you don't disclose an injury when you're getting checked out to to sign with a team, right. <laughs> And I, they found out now as before. I, I to don't be know. clear, what you're saying is that if you go try out for a team yeah. or you're going to sign a contract for yeah. a team, you have to sign something that says, just, just I'm healthy it. enough to yeah. do this. Exactly right. And if I have any injuries, I've got to tell you what right. they are. So I, my, uh, when I was a free agent, I, I told the story about Miami cutting me, the yes. way they cut me. And, you know, it's a business, and, and it happens that way. But they did it in a, in a nasty yeah, but- 
way. Well, you know what? You, some could say after this story that I got on the team in a in a wrong, in a bad way. Well, this is a first for me. I, I don't know this story. I don't story. recall that. I, may, I thought I had, had told this story again. Maybe not. Maybe I'm getting myself into trouble, and maybe right now my wife is going to text me and tell me to shut up. But um, when I was a free agent, uh, that year we were all the first year of free agency, and there were 11 of us as free agents in Philadelphia. None of us resigned with Philadelphia. So I was working out in the off season in Orlando, um, and one of the workouts before I signed with anybody, I was I was a free agent. I was running hills, and I, I ran the hills, and, and it felt like somebody ball batted me in the in the calf, and I tore and Achilles. I tore no, no, I tore my calf. Tore my tore calf. Tore your muscle. calf. Yeah, I tore my calf muscle. It looks weird now because I never got it fixed, so I didn't want to get it fixed because then that would have been on record that I tore my calf. And, you know, it would have been on record then for oh. other teams to see hold on. if this is interesting. So hold on, give me oh, this okay. again. Okay. So so you, you're injured. You're, in, you're a free agent. You yeah. injure yourself yeah. you running on my own on my own. Don't say anything. Tore, definitely tore my calf. I could show you the difference in my calves because I didn't get it fixed. We could we could do that. OK, uh, it was a one good part of my body and I ruined one of them. Um, <clears throat> so. I, I just I just basically let it heal on its own. Let just the scar tissue, you know, build up and heal on its own. And I ended up signing with the Miami Dolphins. Okay. And I was wrote my name. I was healthy when I signed with the Miami Dolphins. Difference in signing bonus. Now, Martellus Bennett uh, got over $8 million. Yeah. I got a $50,000 signing bonus. $50,000. $50,000 I got. Okay. And it was very nice of them. They said, whose name do you want the check in? And I said, put it in my wife's name. Oh, I like that. Cool, you know? It's a nice touch. Yeah. I got a $750,000 salary. It's the highest I made by far ever. And I signed a two-year deal, only made it through one of those years, and 50000 signing bonus. So I was, you know, happy as a pig in slop, you know. Sure. Uh, so, but I knew. So we got to the first workouts. We got to the first training. And, and there was going to be sprints involved. And I knew I had not run on this at all. I was just letting the scar tissue kind of heal up. I knew as soon as I went into a full sprint, it was one of those moments where <clears throat> you, you knew, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to, the scar tissue was going to tear once I put, you know, that kind of pressure on it. I knew it was going to happen. And I listen, I worked hard that offseason because I was a free agent. This was a, such a bummer that it happened because I couldn't do any running after that. So I get into that first sprint. And it was just a matter of time, probably 30 yards in, bam, you know. It, it, the calf it, goes. The calf goes. The, the, the scar tissue in there tears. And, and, and I felt horrible because um, uh, I, I, ju- I just felt like everybody thought I was out of shape. You know, because the tour, they're like, oh, were you, were you even in shape? Did you work out? And I was like, man, I worked out as hard as I ever worked out. But I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say, well, I haven't been able to run for the last X amount of weeks because I had a torn calf that I signed with, still with you guys with a torn calf. Right. Oh. So I missed basically all the preseason. That's, you know, that's when I've told the story about I was in street clothes and there was a fight and I jumped into the fight. Yes, I never knew why you yeah. were in street clothes. Yeah. So, you, oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, Don Shula was going to find me. Don Shula came up and asked me after I tore it. He said, did you work out at all? You know, are you in shape? And I was like, oh, my God, I can't tell you. Yes, I worked out, but I did this. So, so what yeah. did you say? You said yes, I worked out. I, I said yeah, I worked out. I don't, I don't, I can't believe it just happened. Yeah, so I missed the preseason. I ended up starting half the year that year and playing and stuff. It wasn't the, the greatest year of my life. Had another uh, injury that came about, but yeah, that was, um, that was. So I, I, yeah, I, I did not fully disclose in that one. Well, so the staff yeah. has mm-hmm. done a little calculation. <laughs> yep. With inflation, you owe the Dolphins seventy thousand dollars. They'll take a cash or a check. You can make it out to Mike Tannenbaum. Michael Tannenbaum. No, he wasn't there. I mean, Mike no, and I—I I don't think he was born then. <laughs> Mike, Mike, whoa, Mike that's, Tannenbaum that's is that's younger than I am. I know, but he he's was very born. young. I know that, but not born then. Stop it. Was he bar mitzvahed by then? I I'm going to take the I'm, under on that. I know. How Mike. old is Mike you Tannenbaum? Know I, I know Mike Tannenbaum I'm too. Think, he was the GM of the Jets. I know he was. I think Mike and I we can work something what out here. What year was this? Nineteen ninety-two. Ninety-three. Ninety-three. How old is Tannenbaum? What year was he born? So he was born in 69. So he was, okay, he was 24. I mean, seriously? <laughs> you don't even have Tannenbaum reaching stuff. puberty when this thing happens. Well, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry. Okay? All right, I, a, a good point. So, so he's Mike, older and, than I, I thought Mike he was. and I can work out some sort of settlement. Okay. Food fair. related, <laughs> stone crab, something we can something work out we'll... down there. But I did do it. I, I, and I, I never even had a thought about it. How about it. this? 
to make it up to him, yeah. you go down there and you give Mike Tannenbaum a massage. Oh. <laughs> Come on. While you're down there, you're going to be massaging Stu God, so you'll massage Tannenbaum no. also. No, Notre Dame's not losing the game. I'm not massaging anybody. You will massage every prominent Jewish American in Miami. We'll do that. We'll go down there and you'll massage John yeah. Wiener, otherwise known as Stu God, and you'll massage Mike Tannenbaum. How does that sound? Yeah, that doesn't sound good at I all. I think that no. would be... Absolutely. So am I a bad person for doing that? No, you're not. I think this is these are the rules of the game, and they most certainly did you one worse oh, yeah, with the I, way re- they cut you the following re- really year. Really quickly, the way I, I hurt my knee uh, during that season, but I played uh, through the season, and right when the season ended, I got my knee scoped. It was a pretty involved scope because I played a lot of the year on, on a bad knee. And when May rolled around for uh, the mini camp. My knee wasn't 100%, but I wanted to test it out there. I was not in a position to, you know, just keep to take time off. So I told him I want to test my knee out during camp. I was in the, one of the doctor's offices at the facility, and they said, well, you have to sign the sheet that says you're healthy to go do that. And I signed the sheet, said, yeah, I just want to get out there and, and, and move and show that I can play. And I opened the door, and there was someone standing right there, would not let me get out of that room saying the GM wants to see, and I went up and they cut me. And they were but only able to cut you because right. you would sign the piece right. of paper right. saying you were healthy. That's exactly right. So, so you know, it's a business. It's a business. That's what the business yeah. you guys have chosen. Yeah. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance, comparing rates to help you save. Now, that's Progressive. Call and click today. Find out how much Progressive could save you. All right, we're just getting started. We didn't get to anything there, but it was all more than worth it. Uh, Boy, because I might have gotten in trouble? No, you're not going to be in trouble. The statute of limitations has long since passed on that. I think at most, you owe Tannenbaum a massage. (laughs) The best of Mike and Mike. And we say a very cheerful good morning officially now to Mike Golick, Jr., who is here to do any number of different things with us for the time being. But then at the end of today's program is going to be participating in this one chip challenge. How do you feel about this? I'm feeling pretty good. Listen, I've seen enough videos at this point of different athletes and entertainers eating the chip to where based on the reactions I've seen, I feel pretty good about the fact that I'm going to be able to battle through. this. I heard you on your show first and last before this, that you felt like you got roped into this one. Yeah, I, I didn't get roped into it. I was just flat out told this is what you're doing. I had no agency in this whatsoever. By you, by the way. Yeah. I mean, when you said, I'd like to do this, you then said, so we said on the, oh, will you really do it? And you said, yeah. And Mikey will do it too. Listen, all I hear from you, you're a grown man that you, you basically go against what what I say all the time now, why all of a sudden are you listening to me? I mean, it wasn't just you. So you made that decision that set the wheels in motion to where everyone in the show staff just started coming at me about this. I'm getting calls in the middle of the week from Ray Necce, who works on this show, which is a, no, a number that I did not imagine or anticipate seeing pop up on my phone late on a Tuesday night. But here we are. So you got everyone else. It was this packed mentality. And I said, you guys have turned into bullies. You guys got two weeks left on the show, and all of a sudden you think you can just make everyone do everything. And it started with Dan Levitard. And and it's clearly carried over to me. Let the record show I had nothing to do with the one chip challenge. The the, the yeah. massaging of Stu Gatz, I yeah. think I probably yeah. did help you, sort you of magnify that. You were the, the chief on masseuse. Yeah. In some way <laughs> I just own the parlor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing any of the massaging, but I definitely will will uh, will, we, will we have a name for those kind of guys. Yes, and we do. Let's uh-huh. not use that on the air. Mike, <laughs> Mike presented by Progressive Insurance, our guests on the Shell Pinzoil performance line. Okay, let's get to some sports here. Yeah. We've got a million things to get to today. Let's start. With whether or not one NFL coach has lost his team. That NFL coach is Ben McAdoo, and the team, of course, is the New York football Giants. Our Josina Anderson, who's extremely plugged in on a lot of things with a lot of players around the National Football League, had some very interesting reports from Giants camp yesterday, and I think I have them here. Let me play it for you. Here's Josina telling you what she has heard from several players on the Giants roster. There was a Giants player who wishes to remain anonymous, reached out to me and said this unsolicited at the time, this being last week, saying, quote, McAdoo has lost his team. He's got us going 80 percent on Saturday before we get on the plane to play a game. It's wild. Changed our off day. He's dishing out fines like crazy. Suspended two of our stars when we need them the most. Throws us under the bus all the time. He's run us into the ground and people wonder why we've been getting got. And then I also heard from another Giants player who said unsolicited, guys are giving up on the season and nothing's being done. Guys just don't care anymore. So that's Josina Anderson yesterday. Guys, your reaction? Well, I mean, I think you know where I'm going to go here. L- listen, I- I- I've been in locker rooms that, are- that have been in disarray, but I- I'm tired of the anonymous player sitting there telling me, oh, I confess it's his fault. You know, you go on the field. You line up. 
to not make your block. You miss the tackle. You don't do what you're supposed to do on the field. You want to say it's the coaching staff. I get it's all a team thing and you're all part of it. I understand that. But, my God, you don't sound like you're taking any responsibility at all. Oh, we're not no, – no guys are trying anymore, and it's the coach's fault because he doesn't get as motivated and works as too hard. And just shut up. I mean, to me, it's embarrassing. Landon Collins, the giant safety, disputes what these players have said. He said McAdoo has been leading the same way he led last year when they had, oh, 11 wins, correct? Last I checked, 10 or 11. Yeah, 10 or 11 the playoffs, wins? For sure, way more yeah. than last year, right? Atlanta Collins said, so I don't knock the way he's been doing things. Finding people like crazy? If you don't follow the rules, you get in trouble because you got to pay the consequences. I wouldn't say he lost the team. I have the utmost respect for him. Uh, Dominique rogers Cromarty, who was one of the players suspended, said basically the same thing. I don't think this locker room is lost. And so they go the other way. And, and like anything else, it's probably somewhere in the middle. But, Greeny, you know me and this anonymous garbage that goes on. i, I got to get on this, the, the one player here. i gotta, I got to find the quote. The, uh, I, just, just the way I'm reading this, the other anonymous player also said, I'm going to keep it 100. I'm going to tell it like it is, and it's terrible. Oh, are you going to keep it 100, Mr. Anonymous? Good job out of you, Mr. I'm not going to say my name, but I'm going to keep it real. You're, that's embarrassing. You're, making, you're an embarrassment right now to that locker room and the anonymous comments you're making. Go out there and play. It's not going well this year. Don't blame a coach because your ass ain't getting it done on the field. That's, uh, this aggravates me, Mike, more than anything else in the world when you get the anonymous person complaining the way they do and blaming somebody else for what's going wrong on the field. I didn't want to get this aggravated this early in the morning, but that's one of the things that really teased me off. Did you get it all out? I did. I, I, just wanted, I, wanted, to, I wanted to make sure you wrung all that out right now. You're holding on to a lot of stress. It was in your shoulders. Well, you and know, I got the massage thing hanging over my yeah, head. No, chip, the chip thing in a couple yeah. hours. No, so I get it. If that was a little harsh, you know, maybe it was a little harsh, but uh, you know me. I Listen, all kidding aside, I hate the anonymous garbage. I hate it. And it sounds like you're blaming somebody else for your problems. Is McAdoo part of the problem and, this, and, and what's going on? Absolutely. But you know what? Take some ownership into what's going on in that field. And all of that, I feel like, can, can be put in the pile of, yes, abs- absolutely. Everyone's got to own up to their portion of this. But if we're looking at the situation that's been pointed out here and removing the party that's bringing us the right, information right. and taking an honest assessment of how you're leading and what you're doing in all this, I think there's a way to do it. Like, you've got a team that's spiraling a bit right now, and – you probably see players looking around saying, all right, how do we get that group back in? Because the sentiment of these comments right. seems to be the guys are disinterested, right. guys aren't holding up there, and not necessarily the guys that are even coming out with these anonymous comments, but something they're observing. Guys aren't being held accountable, and the leadership in place isn't holding them accountable, and that starts with the head coach on most teams. You can look at other places, and you can say, well, look at the Miami Dolphins. Comparatively, not even in as dire straits record-wise as a team, but you've got Adam Gase shipping guys off yes, to other do. places, yeah. sitting guys down, Rattling cages a little bit. We've heard him very publicly and very sternly chastising his team for the way that they've performed. And so maybe there's some of these guys looking around and saying, man, that's what this locker room could use a little bit of. Now, you could say that locker rooms should be led by the players, and most truly great locker rooms are. They have that coming from within. But for a team that's young in a lot of places, that seems to have, you know, they brought a lot of that talent in from the outside last year, so it's not homegrown guys that have been around that locker room and maybe have the pulse for a long time, and a lot of their veteran players are injured and hurt, a lot of their best ones. I don't think you can discount what they're saying, but I agree the method of delivery is always something that – kind of raises an eyebrow because it preclu- it re- excuses you from all blame. 100% agree with you. 100% agree about what they're saying you can understand. I just hate the message. I hate the – because as Joe Cena was reading those quotes from the players, right, tell me somewhere in the quote where, where that player said, it's on all of us. I didn't hear that. Didn't hear that part of it, right? So, yes, it could be a mess in that locker room. I completely agree. Do I think McAdoo's job is done there? Absolutely, I think it's going to be done there. And it is in disarray in that locker room. And I'm sure those anonymous players were telling the truth partially to what the problem is. But I can't stand the fact when it's all about somebody else. And they did, it, I would – listen, I don't like it anyway when you're talking out of school like that as far as I'm concerned, just say in the locker room. But at least I would have had a little more – for the anonymous person, if they'd at least said, you know what, I don't, we don't, I don't think he's a good leader right now, but it's on all of us because we have to step up and play as well. I didn't hear any of that. 
All I heard is, I swear I confess he did it, not me. And that's what aggravates me. It aggravates me, the anonymous. It aggravates me talking out of school, out of the locker room. And it aggravates me when you don't wear the hat of some responsibility. Because you can have the worst game plan in the world, but you're still out there in one-on-one battles that you can try and win. For the anonymous piece of it, this doesn't necessarily make it any better, but I did hear, I was actually watching when Josina was on one of the shows. She was on a bunch of shows with this reporting yesterday. She said that one of the players involved, I think it was that quote, he he didn't want his name attached to it for fear it would affect his playing time. You know, it would it, he would he. It doesn't sound to me like that was a star player, meaning no, no, it's I, someone who oh, would then be I, that, well, listen, disciplined or whatever. You don't even have to say that. That's exactly why it isn't. You, it's anonymous for a reason. Right. They don't want any repercussions from it. That, okay. That's the reason. Let me ask you a question, Mikey, because you were on a team, and, and again, you were a kid, right? But but you're in college. When the year, what, what proved to be Charlie Weiss's last year, when it was loss after loss after loss, and it was a very high profile thing because it was Notre Dame and it was Charlie and everything else. Obviously, you remember what I'm talking about, and Mike and I remember it, and he wound up getting fired at the end of that year. And the, the losses kept piling up. What was that like inside there? Because the whole world wants to know what's going on with Charlie. Now, as a college player, you're a little more insulated from media and all that kind of stuff. But was there some of this stuff? Was there this kind of splintering? Was there like, you know, the coaches lost the team kind of thing? No, there was frustration. And, I mean, you certainly saw that start to boil over. But that happens anytime you're losing, even in the best franchises, when things are going well. I mean, I remember early on when I was in training camp with the Steelers, they had just come off a couple of disappointing seasons. And you could tell it was a noticeably ornery Mike Tomlin, who had been used yeah. to winning and been used to their standard, but was upset. And it was a more physical training camp, you know, hearing from the veterans because of that. And so, yeah, there were, there were you know, I, I don't want to say blow-ups, but there was certainly tension in there, frustration at times. There's never a loss of the locker room that I can point back to. There are still plenty of guys and still plenty of guys now that love Charlie and, and talk to him yeah. all the time. But the difference is you also see the writing coming on the wall, and there might be some of that in New York right now where you just know where this is going. You know, we're not dumb in all of this, and you can read. We knew after a certain point, and there was even a certain game I remember in that season where it might have been Stanford when we went out there, and it was either our last or second-to-last game, when you start to realize, like, this this might be it with your relationship with this person in a player-coach setting, and... Everyone feels the energy. It robs the energy of that group. When you know going into the year, all right, this is kind of a make-or-break year, and once you start to feel it break, it, it, it becomes tough to just keep that morale going, and that seems to be what begets situations like this, where you've got differing opinions yeah. and differing factions throughout the locker yeah, room. Absolutely right, and then, then it really kind of falls on – where are the leaders in the locker room? Because the one thing you want to do is you want to get guys together and say, okay, let's keep this in-house. This doesn't need to be getting out anywhere. Let's, it's going bad right now. What happens is players start to play a little more for themselves, saying, okay, that coach is not going to be there. I'm playing to get good tape to make sure I have a job here or somewhere else. That's the, those are the things that start to happen. But I, I'm sorry. I, I, just, I just can't deal with the anonymous, it's somebody else's fault situation. No when, when everything there may be going on. Just like it is. But but still, you're on the field. You have a say in what's going on. So take take part of your responsibility as well. You have no reason to be sorry. You're Carolina Reaper Pepper hot three hours before taking yeah. the challenge. Got a headache now. Hey, everyone. Mike Golick here. Support for Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Hey, girl, have you done something new with your scales? Using new moisturizer? Nice. It really brings out the hazel in your eyes. Oh, hold on. Are you using whitening strips, too? Your fangs look good, girl. Really good. A really charming snake charmer? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. Wait, what? Have you been doing Pilates, too? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Very busy Thursday. Mike, Mike, and Mike as we speak. Mike Golick Jr. is here. We're presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests on the Shell Pentel Performance Line. Stu Gotts will join us shortly in advance of the massage that he oh. is 
he's got to be looking forward to. Now, Mikey, of the three of us, you know him the best. As you work with him every Sunday here on ESPN Radio and all sorts of other stuff. You know that regardless of, of what complaint he may be lodging publicly, he loves this. He loves the fact that the loser of this wager is going to be massaging him. Oh, 100%. Stu Gatz is going to turn the lights off. He's going to light a candle. I... He's going to – see, I just – I imagined it the other way with Stu Gatz doing the massaging and those little sausage fingers just creeping all over the place, you know, finding all the nooks and crannies and the knots to really get out there. That's the disturbing visual that I covet. He's going to love this, though. He's already talking, you know, really lovingly about your big, strong hands. I want you to manhandle them a little bit. So Ooh. that's that's what the, the yeah. stakes are of the Notre Dame-Miami wager between Golick and Dan Lebertard. We're going to preview Rubbing that it. game in a couple of minutes with both coaches uh, in uh, here – just in a few minutes on Mike and Mike. A couple of quick uh, tweets, reaction to Golick's really strong thoughts on the anonymous Giants quotes earlier through the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. Sports Q tweets, I so agree with Golick. I hate the anonymous source who isn't man enough to say, uh, what this, to, to say what they say with their name attached. Hashtag cowardly. And then Philly fan Dan tweets, this anonymous player for the Giants said what we already know. We just have to look at their effort to see the players aren't playing for the coach. And, and you, I, go ahead. You don't play for the coach. You don't play. There's not one coach I played for where I went out on that field and said, you know what, this game I'm playing for you, coach. You can like your coach. You can dislike your coach. You don't go out and play for your coach. If you don't go out and play for the fact that you're playing and give your effort, and I get it. Mike brought it up last hour. I get it when all is falling apart and it's not that cohesive unit. I do understand it can be tougher. But the line about not playing for the coach, forget that. Like, you, players don't play for the coach. Oh, no. Usually, in, in a lot of cases, it can end up being the opposite. Exactly you can play right. in spite of, but uh, I guess to the point about leadership in this is that then it falls on not only the coach, but the leadership in that organization right. to identify and say, okay, if these are the players that are mailing in right now that need some sort of coach's rah-rah speech to get them going, those are the guys we need gone. Like, we need the guys that are going to be self-motivated enough by, A, the paycheck that we're throwing their way because this is a business transaction, and, B, their own pride in their professional work, that that wouldn't be the case. Here's my thought, and the tweeter's right. We all see what's going on. What is your motive for giving an anonymous quote? What, what do you think you're accomplishing by that? Are you trying to let the world know, hey, 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 <laughs> it's a mess in here, it ain't me. I can play ball. I can ball. Okay. There's all these other reasons on why I'm not looking really good on the field right now. And it ain't me. That's what's going on right here. That was the point I was terrible. I did a terrible job of trying to make earlier with my concept of whistleblowers, which is to, to give anonymous, to give information anonymously. If you're deep throat and, you know, and this is an investigation into something of that magnitude, right. if people's lives are at stake and things like that, that's admirable. To be giving anonymous quotes inside a football locker room about how things are, are deteriorating around you is cowardly. You're trying to, I, I would agree with you're that. You're trying to tell everybody why it's not your fault is well, what you're doing. That, that part I don't I would maybe dispute just because your name's not on it. So no one knows where to not assign the blame in this outside of Josina Anderson, who was the one who had this specifically. So if you want Josina to know it's not your fault, congratulations. You accomplished that bit of good. This, to me, seems you want to signal to everyone else, like, there's problems and we need change. Like, yours, this is kind of like a little coup, right? Well, like you see the way this is going, and you would like for everyone to know, including management. We always talk about when coaches get up in front of the mic, they're very aware of the message that they're they are sending, sending to players right. who are listening. This player is probably very aware, I'd assume, of the message he's sending to everyone else, which is that there is disarray here. People above making decisions take note of just how much chaos is going on within your building if you haven't already. See, in, in my case, I'm not giving an anonymous quote that much credit. I'm just not. I, I'm, I'm, to me, I get what you're saying, but I'm also saying that these anonymous quote players are on the field and see that they're getting beat, see that they're not playing well, see that they're losing. And to me, part of their anonymous quote is to give an excuse on why that's happening. It's because we're in disarray. It's because our coach is not a leader. It's because he doesn't have a game plan. That's why we look this way. We're not really this bad. When last year, I, I, I believe, you had the same coach, right? Pretty much same players. 
They right? did have the same coach. Now, 17 of their players are on injured reserve this year, so it's, it's the second Certainly most in the league. So it. a lot of the same players aren't there. They were on the roster. They've been injured. But, yes, your point is well taken. This is essentially the same team that made the playoffs last year, and no one seemed to have a problem with the coach. We then. also know that winning and the, how well the team performs can make a coach look better than he is. Sure. I'm not going to let you know Ben McAdoo skate in all of this. You learn a lot about people when the chips go down. But to, to your point, this all really comes back to this idea, and it really is, I guess, based on the situations we laid down. Either the person throwing out anonymous quotes is really smart and calculated and underhanded or really dumb because you're trying to absolve yourself from blame in a way that points to absolutely no one in particular who would be absolved from that blame. Exactly. So. Exactly right. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I, I think we all believe McAdoo is going to be gone and the whole thing is going to start over again. And, and But they've got, what, eight more games. You've got eight more games of this stuff. And, and now, listen, this is what the daily, uh, you know, the, the beat reporters are going to do. They're going to get in there, and they're going to pry, and they're going to ask, and they're going to pry, and they're going to pry. And, and you may get more stuff. Yeah, it's going to be interesting what now comes out of that locker room. All right, let's get on to some other stuff here. Yep. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Progressive celebrating five years and more than 500 cars donated to vets. To learn more, visit keystoprogress.com. Okay, a blockbuster story yesterday in the New York Times and then expanded upon by our crew at Outside the Lines. Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, and this is what I was referring to when I said there are some things in life even billions of dollars cannot always buy you. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, who has emerged as, I, I think, probably the most powerful voice in the National Football League. Was, is that, is, is that, that's a, Do we is that say a powerful or most heard? He's not afraid to be heard, but is he the most powerful? Well, I, think I guess we, we, we could find out here. Yeah, so, somehow, I think when you're, when you're the... When you have the biggest stadium, when you have the biggest team, when your team is the Cowboys, I, I feel like he's in the center of everything. He, he puts himself in he the center of everything. There, yeah. Well, it, let, let me even take that out of it. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have gone down that road. The Cowboys owner has hired famed lawyer David Boys, and, and people know David Boys. He represented Al Gore in the recount of the election in 2000. He actually represented the NFL mm -hmm. in the CBA negotiations right. some years ago. 2011, yeah. Um, he has hired him. And together they are exploring the option of suing the league if Goodell is awarded a if Roger Goodell is awarded a contract extension after the 2018 season, as is being considered. And by the way, not just being considered. I mean, there is a belief that the committee that is assigned to put this together, of which Jones is not a member, is ready to move forward right. with the contract extension for Goodell at huge amounts of money. Goodell, I mean, Roger, Jerry Jones has jumped into the middle of this. And in the story, as you read it further, not only is he uh, threatening to sue the league, he's actually threatening to sue other individual owners in this. So you're talking about a guy who has not only gone rogue, but he is taking a huge stand. And this has been set up now really strongly as Jerry Jones on one side, Roger Goodell on the other. And it will be fascinating to see which owners fall where as it goes. Junior. Well, that seems to be the point of all this because... You know, you heard our legal analysts say, what, what are they going to sue them for? What is he going to sue them for? What grounds is there to actually take legal action in all of this? So it seems to be about figuring out where the line in the sand is. Like, to your point, Jerry Jones is good at inserting him in situ himself into situations where he may not even be supposed to be in a lot of these like you mentioned the compensation committee that's a part of deciding on the future of Roger Goodell's contract it has six members Jerry Jones isn't a member but all we hear in this article is that he's basically been like a pseudo seventh member he considers himself a seventh member he's on a lot of the calls he has a lot of this information and that group asked him to leave told the other owners this is what's going on this is what he plans to do and so now you've kind of got a choice where either you let the fox into the he into the den, and you start having these lines divided, and the whole place turns on it. Or you check this guy. Like this is a guy who's losing control, who's very used to, like all these owners are, of being billionaires and controlling every little part of their world. And when you rip control from this guy in a way that's happened in a few instances, one financially he believes because of protest, and two. I guess in another way, financially, because you're messing with one of his biggest assets and Zeke Elliott on a weekly basis now, you have ripped control from this guy, and you see how billionaires respond when you make control go away. Uh, again, Jerry Jones, to, to, to where he served the paper, basically this compensation committee, Jerry Jones told them legal papers were being drawn up and would be served Friday if the committee did not scrap its plans to extend Goodell's contract. What's he suing? I, and, and he and he hasn't said what are the, what are the base or what are the grounds. He hasn't, hasn't identified the grounds of the lawsuit. I have no idea. I, to me and, and others have said it. I'm not I'm not the one with this idea. 
a lot of people believe it's just a scare tactic. He has zero, z- absolutely zero basis to sue anybody in this. But you're right, and, and the term they use is he wasn't part of the six uh, uh, compensation committee member. He was made an ad hoc member. So he was, here, you're kind of a member now. You can have a say, and now that ad hoc has been revoked. <laughs> now those six have said, okay, Jerry, you're no longer part of this at all. What it's going to do, basically, is you're going to find out because you need 24 votes, okay? That this, when, when, you, when you say sue the league, it's like, who are you suing? It's like when you sue the NCAA, who are you suing? The university presidents? If you say you're suing the league, are you suing the owners? The owners of the league. The owners are the ones who hire Roger Goodell. So basically, I think that uh, Jerry Jones is, is really firmly planting his foot in taking the temperature of, okay, who's with me? Who wants him out? Now's our chance. And supposedly there are four or five owners that do, and then supposedly a bunch of fence-sitters of who they're kind of, you know, that's who you go after. There are people that will want Roger Goodell back. There are those that won't want him back. And then there are the fence-sitters that are going to decide this whole thing. And those are the ones that you're going for. And the one thing I will say, Jerry Jones inserts himself into a lot of situations. But what's one thing about all these billionaires? None of them want to be considered followers. Right. They all want to be considered leaders. So how many just start following Jerry Jones? That's going to be an interesting one. Just because he's the loudest in the room doesn't mean everyone's going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're with Jerry. We stand behind Jerry. Well, I I think part of it might be how much they want to follow Jerry, but part of it might be how they perceive the job that Goodell has done. Yep. So Roger Goodell has built himself enormous equity. And I choose that word specifically with the owners because of the way he handled the 2011 CBA negotiations by everyone's estimation. He won that thing in a, in a, in a knockout in the first round. Right. And, and, but now you could argue anyone could have that the NFL owners are so much more powerful, have so much have such deeper pockets for all the reasons that we've gone over a trillion times on this show that maybe any, Anyone would have won that collective bargaining agreement, but he won it big and it has made the owners hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. each. So you build up a lot of equity with guys when you do that for them. And that's why they pay you forty four million dollars in a year. Since that time, one thing after another has gone wrong. And in no particular order, it has included the way the league has handled domestic violence, Mm -hmm. the way the league has handled the protests uh, that have involved kneeling during the national anthem that have so inflamed passions across the country, uh, the way it has handled the issue of the way the league is perceived regarding CTE and, and other things. Now, these are all really complicated issues that I'm not sure anybody would have handled perfectly. But it could be argued, and maybe there are owners in that in that fraternity who argue that the league is 0 for 3 on those, the three biggest issues facing them right now. And as a consequence, why would we just rubber stamp a contract extension for the guy in charge at huge dollars? And that's what they believe they're paying him to do, right, is make those problems mitigate them, make some of them go away, and make them less of a problem for the owners who want to just sit there and collect that paycheck. Because this is basically a really high-profile contract negotiation. Like Roger Goodell wants no business of taking less money at this point. He's become accustomed to a lifestyle that's netted him $200 million so far from these guys. And the ultimate example of that phrase being really a complete farce that it's not per- personal, it's just business, the whole reason this business is getting muddy because Jerry Jones was in on this committee extending Roger Goodell at the owners meetings months ago but since that time period it's gotten personal because Jerry Jones's best player has been basically going through what Tom Brady went through last year with the deflate gate saga where it's a week in week out trial of the guy that you want on the field so you can win and it's ultimately rubbed him the wrong way enough the same way being left out of those meetings I'm sure at the last round of ownership meetings about the protest rubbed Jerry Jones the wrong way like he's being pushed out of a lot of the rooms that he has forced himself in the center of for a long time and he's clearly not responding well and if you look at the relationship between Jerry Jones I'm sorry Mike and Papa John yeah. and 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 that and Papa John coming out and talking publicly about it being a lack of leadership what was the word he used a failure of leadership whatever yeah. the specific word he used was there are many people who perceive that to have been Jerry Jones' words right, right. in the mouth of one of the league's most significant partners and sponsors. So you, you can see where this battle has, the battle yeah, lines has, have been drawn. Has. I really don't know where it's going to go. Yeah, boy, certainly he's thrown the other pizza places at Papa John. I don't think it's really gone the way Papa John expected this thing to go, quite honestly. To Mike's point about the money, since August 2006, when he became commissioner, he has made $200 million, including $44 million in 2014, $34 million 
in 2015, and he's, he's somewhat angry. The reports are that he's somewhat angry that they want to make this contract more performance-based, basically saying, I'm making these guys a lot of money. You have Let me play that Go side ahead. of it, because we haven't gotten to that. Yeah. There's all this owner's side of it. Yeah. Then there's Goodell's side of it. Now, we know Roger Goodell, yep. Mike and I do, yep. over the years and stuff like that. Most people obviously don't have a personal relationship with him, but we don't know him so well. I mean, we don't... We don't socialize together or anything right. like that. But there's one thing. The most important thing you read in that thing is he's made over $200 million. Yes, he has. He doesn't have Jerry Jones money, but he's got more than enough money to walk away from this if he decides, he I don't like need this on, anymore, right. and live a very, very, you know, he's got as much money as almost any NBA superstar has. So he could walk away if he doesn't need this anymore. And our Seth Wickersham, who along with Don Van Atta has done magnificent reporting on all of this, suggests he doesn't think it's impossible that may happen. There's some people who say look, Jerry's kind of ready for a new commissioner, and he has some people in mind. There's other people who are saying, look, he wants an incentive-based deal with less guaranteed money. And we've been told that Roger Goodell does not want to take a deal like that. And he feels like he's made these guys a bunch of money. He's taken a ton of bullets for them over the years. And he doesn't think he deserves a haircut. To me, this is what it all comes down to. And in in this article, it said most owners would admit Roger's done a terrible job handling the anthem controversy, terrible job explaining the TV ratings decline, a terrible job on a number of other issues. And if they want to say a terrible job, what does it all come down to? It comes down to money. Because those owners sitting in that room understand that they're going to take some some PR hits, and they can deal with PR hits, but it's when they hit their pocket, Right. That, that's going to be the issue to them. And that's one thing Jerry is looking into. Can he bring in and show financials that actually show, hey, guys, Roger Goodell is costing you money. If he can do that, that to me is going to be all the difference in the world because the, the NFL can take a lot. It can take a lot of abuse, and Roger Goodell is the one that takes a lot of the abuse and gets a big paycheck for it. They can take a lot. But the owners, they will start to – it's just like – when, when things go wrong at, at companies and when does, when does the company really sit up and take notice? Well, when the big advertisers start pulling it, it costs some money. It's the same thing here. When the owners all of a sudden realize, you know what? Not as money, much money is going into my pocket. We may, may need to rethink this. So to me, Mike, that's what it all comes down to is can it be shown, and this is what Jerry Jones is going to want to do, hey, Roger Goodell is actually costing us money. If he can prove that, he may get them to side with him. If he can't, it's a $14 billion a year industry that is just stuffing money in the pocket to the owners. If that's not going to change much, Roger Goodell is going to be the commissioner. My interest in this lies is what comes next because we have basically one of what I see as two outcomes mainly that can happen. Is one is Jerry Jones can get that group on his side and we likely face the prospect of a new commissioner for the first time in a while. Because if Jerry Jones can get enough people on his side, that's the way this goes. If Roger Goodell really isn't into the business of taking less money to do the same job, then you assume there's going to be a different guy and it's going to be Jerry's guy more than likely because that seems to be the other part of this people are uh, are disgruntled with. So we've got that where we either see a change in the power atop the league or we see a change in the power of one of the chief movers and shakers yeah. in Jerry Jones. Because if you go and call everyone else out, if you're that friend in your fantasy league that starts pointing at everyone else and saying you're cheating, you're this, you're that, and then everyone sides against you, what happens? You're usually not back in that fantasy league the next year. And they can't make Jerry sell the Cowboys, but they can potentially make his voice and see his voice become a lot quieter it in those meeting rooms yeah. and freeze him out a little bit more based on basically trying to stage a coup. Mike and Mike presented by Shell Penzo. I'll get instant gold stack. Status at Shell. Join the Fuel Rewards program now at FuelRewards.com slash gold. So before I uh, pose this question, and I'm going to take it to break on the question, before I pose it, I want to make it clear. I do not believe Roger Goodell is going to be replaced as the NFL commissioner anytime soon. I I believe the outcome of all of this is that he is going to remain the commissioner. I don't know exactly what the mechanics of it will be, but I think he's going to be the commissioner. He's going to get another contract and he's going to stay. Having said that, it is worth it is sort of an interesting exercise. Who would become the commissioner if he were to be out? Roger Goodell, for those who don't know, succeeded Paul Tagliabue, but Goodell has been working for the league for decades. He was there. He, was, right. he, was, he worked his way up to becoming you know, sort of the number two guy at the league, but he's been there forever, and he's been someone that they've known forever. I don't think that person exists right now. Maybe there's someone in there that I'm not aware That's of. I don't thing. think I, that I don't person either, exists. Yeah. I do I not. Know. So when baseball was looking for a new commissioner, they stayed inside. They, they hired Rob Manfred, who was, I believe, the COO, whatever he was. He was the guy under uh, Seelig for years and years and years. 
Um, Adam Silver, same thing. David Stern, he was the number two guy. He was being groomed. He was being prepped. He was ready to go. This is a different circumstance. This isn't Roger Goodell at 70 deciding he's going to retire and someone new. I think they would have to go outside. And it is kind of an interesting question. Who would make a good commissioner for the National Football League? You're not going to say you, are you? No, no, no. Yeah, this seemed like where this this question was going. No, 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 no. Again, you want to be the baseball commissioner. That's a 15-year-old joke. I'm not doing that one. I'm asking an honest question. Who, Who do you think would make a good? This is a tough job. And they're entering a brutal period. I mean, what they've got going on now between all of the concussion stuff and wherever this thing is going to net out on on, on the, the, the kneeling and everything else and dipping television ratings and a complete change in the way the viewing is done and everything else, it's not an easy job. I'd be really curious to hear who you think, and on Twitter, at us, at Mike and Mike, who do you think would make a good commissioner of the National Football League if it isn't going to be Roger going forward? The best of Mike and Mike. Here we are. We're back in better than ever. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Mike Golick Jr. in here with us a little later this morning. He and Golick and Trey Wingo and maybe Damian Woody. Yeah. We'll be taking part in the Carolina Reaper Pepper Challenge. I don't know for sure. Your wife was tweeting with D. Wood getting him in on this, and so he may be doing it. I'm well, not 100% sure. She's as well? She seems to be getting... Wow. She, you know mom likes throwing see. herself in the middle of bets that work out well for other people. Well, I was going to say, that don't affect her at all. Last I checked, I was the one naked and oiled up with you taking pictures of me. She didn't get involved in that, and now all of a sudden Damien's eating a chip and she's at home laughing. That, that's. I think he's going to do it. I'm not 100% sure. We'll find out when he gets here. You guys have to sign a waiver, yeah. which we'll get to as well. Uh, quickly, on some of the Twitter here, Jeff tweets at us, how about Stu Gotts as the next commissioner of the <laughs> NFL? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> if you're going to give a bobblehead today, that might ah, be the one. You're not kidding. That's Stu will one. join us shortly, and all the Twitter comes through the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. If your football obsession has strained a relationship, you need 1-800-Flowers.com. For a limited time, 1-800-Flowers is offering up to 40% off best-selling bouquets and gifts perfect for birthdays and anniversaries. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. All right, before Stu gets, I just want to preview three of these huge college games quickly. Let's finish up on Oklahoma TCU. Golick Jr., you strongly like Oklahoma. I can give you the number on that game, by the way. Vegas has Oklahoma minus 6.5. Our football power index makes Oklahoma a five-point favorite. So you would give 6.5 points? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I I think I would as well. I think I would as well. Listen, they came in as as ranked one of the best offensive lines in the country, so it's certainly going to be on. on Right, they're giving up 27 points a game. As I mentioned, TCU just under – 13 points, or just under 14 points. Baker Mayfield is having himself a year again, you know, going to be in the top four again, if not winning the Heisman this time around. They have some weapons on that offense. Going to, again, I look at the defense as Oklahoma gives up a lot of points. We just saw it last week. Uh, and and what, what can Kenny Hill do? You know, for the offense for TCU, can he keep scoring a lot on an Oklahoma defense? So which side do you? Oh, I'm going to Oklahoma. I'm giving the points. points. Yes, yes. And so you are as well. Okay. Because everybody keeps saying, you know, oh, why ain't anybody giving any love to TCU? Well, TCU, this is your chance. This is your chance to shut everybody up and say, we are going to the party by winning this game, and and then you carry on from there. Georgia-Auburn this week. Georgia is a a two-and-a-half-point favorite in Vegas. Our FPI makes Auburn the slimmest of favorites. Auburn, at home, the slimmest of favorites. And Herbie said on the air this week he thinks there's a good chance. With us, he said, a good chance that Auburn beats Georgia. Mikey, do you think there is? I don't just because I think Georgia saw the best rushing attack they're going to see this season. Like, Auburn rush structure wise to me just because the way that offense operates end up being a lot like Notre Dame's just a lesser version like the offensive line's not quite as good Cameron Petway and the running back stable they've got there carry on Johnson and company are good backs they're solid backs and having Jared Stinham in that rotation as well as a quarterback who can move helps but I just think they already saw the best of that they did very well I think you know gave up something like 55 yards rushing to Notre right. Dame yep. when they played them in South Bend I think they're ready for this moment and I think Jake Fromm is ready Ready for this moment. Yeah, you I, mentioned Johnson, Kenyon Johnson. Yes, 15 rushing touchdowns uh, this year. So I, I agree. They're a good running team. I don't think they're as good a running team as Notre Dame. And Georgia did a real nice job of shutting down that running game uh, in Fromm's first start. I like Georgia in this. I like the two-headed monster running. I think Fromm's got some good experience throughout the season, even though he's just a freshman. They're not asking him, and that what Herbie brought up, and I have brought up as well, and I agree, if Fromm is asked to win the game with his arm, then we'll see what kind of a test that's going to be, but I don't know if he's going to be. I, I want to throw one game into the mix that is not one of the Glamour games this weekend, though it does involve one of the college football playoff teams. 
when the season began, we would have said that Clemson, Florida State this weekend was yeah. going to be the biggest game. Yep. And obviously it isn't. Florida State's season has spiraled completely out of control. But beware the team that's playing at Super Bowl. For Florida State, and there's a bunch of kids on that team that are going to wind up in the NFL, and this is their Super Bowl. They can't accomplish anything they intended to this season, but they can knock off Clemson, their arch rival. So I, I'm always wary of a team like that. Do you give Florida State with, with literally everything in the world to play for this week? Because other than that, I mean, they're 3-5. and five. Do you give Florida State any chance? Uh, I don't just because Clemson still has a ton to play for. I mean, this is a team that already with one loss on his resume, kind of like the other year where they end up going on to the national title, understands that now it's playoff every week. It's a team that already got their eyes watered a little bit and is going to come in ready to go because of that and because of that understanding that personnel-wise, you're going to turn on the tape during the week, kind of the point I brought up. Those guys, when they watch the tape, they're not going to see a Florida State team that's lost more games than we expected. They're going to see a Florida State team, especially on defense, full of stud NFL prospects that they know they're going to have their hands full with all that. I almost would be worried more if Clemson were undefeated, knowing they could maybe give up one loss. They're, they're at their end, right? They can't lose two. Correct. They're not going to lose two and be in. So th- I don't think it's going to happen. It's in Clemson as well. I think it's one of those where I, I agree with you about Florida State. They're going to come out and try and make it their Super Bowl. But if it starts to get away from them, I think you'll see the wind come out of the sails. And then let's circle it back to Notre Dame in Miami again. That's where game day will be this weekend. If you're in that area, they'll be live in Coral Gables. And then, of course, ABC Saturday Night Primetime has the game. Notre Dame in Miami. Vegas has the Irish a three-and-a-half-point favorite. Our power index makes Notre Dame a four-point favorite. Uh, we all know what they like to do. They want to run the football against you. We saw Miami with a very impressive win last week against Virginia Tech. Junior, give me a breakdown on the game. This one, I mean, I'm always selfishly going to whittle it down to the finest point, which is uh, inside the trenches. And that's where the best battle is going to be. Miami defensively has a defensive front seven full of pro prospects. Sure do. Full of that yep. young linebacking core that we talked about coming of age during last season that is going to have their hands full against Notre Dame's front seven because I was concerned that Notre Dame against USC was fool's gold. I felt a lot better when I saw them go against that NC State defense that is full of pro prospects yep. on the D-line and not just beat them, but bloody their nose the way that they did in that one. That was a statement performance from that group up front. Now, in Notre Dame, you've got to hope that Josh Adams is 100% healthy coming off that Wake Forest game where we didn't see him for the lion's share of the second half because he was a little nicked up, because they were ahead and didn't have to play and saw this on the horizon. Brandon Wimbush, though, Wake force is a big game for him a lot more passing options and attacks in a game that was a little slick a little wet and where he showed well for himself because Miami on the other side is going to try and test them they're going to run stretch zones Rozier in that passing game are potent they've got good receivers yeah but they give the ball away a lot I, like yeah. four turnovers a game forced by their defense is masking a lot of problems lately on that offense which is them giving the ball to the other team and no one is as good at points off turnovers in the ncaa right now as notre dame yeah and, and they that you saw that in that michigan state game you know when when they turned three turnovers into 21 points i agree I, i'm with you the 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 thing that worries me is that georgia defense they got the best of notre dame's offense because of speed and Miami has some speed on their defense in that front seven. Um, but to Mike's point, I agree. North Carolina State, I think, was sixth in the country against the rush, and Notre Dame ran all over them. Miami's 66. Now, you can't just go by numbers because these are athletic players on Miami's defense. Front seven, speed, linebackers are young, and they fly around. So, uh, but, but I think Notre Dame, when you run that well, you just wear down a team. So I, I don't think it's going to get to the point where Brandon Wimbush is going to have to throw them back into the game because that's a one element we just haven't seen yet. Uh, he's been able to throw out save for Georgia with the lead, and Georgia wasn't a high-scoring game on either side at 20-19. to 19. So I think Notre Dame will take care of business on the offensive side, control the ball. Defensively, they're schematically playing so much better than they did a year ago. All right, and, and as many of you who follow the show or follow the Dan Lebitard show no, Golick has a lot at stake in this game. And his wager yeah. with Dan Lebitard, the loser has to massage Stu Gatz. Uh. Let's go right to the source. Stu Gatz joins us live from South Florida this morning on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Stu, are you, are, you, are you loosening up? Are you ready for this massage next week? Because you can't lose no matter what happens here. No, I can't lose. Listen, I'm the center of attention. We all know that I love that. This is fun. It's a spa day for me. I want a 90-minute sweetest massage. I'm, I'm hoping that Miami wins because I want those big mitts, those big paws of Mike Golick. 
In fact, I want a Golic massage. I want Junior in on this as well because I don't have any stakes with Mike Golic Jr. And we do a show every Sunday, 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio. I want an entire Golic massage. I want those hands, all four of those hands on my glutes. That's fine, but Stu Gatz, the minute Notre Dame wins, I don't need anything from you because I saw last night the only person on your show staff that actually cares and believes in this Miami team is your producer, Mike Ryan. So I want, yeah. I'm looking for that. When Notre Dame wins, get Mike Ryan a ticket up to Bristol and have him come massage my buns because he's got it coming. He's talking a lot of gas right now. All right, I will get that back going if you want. I mean, listen, Mike is delusional. He's a fan. He's a fanatic. He loves the University of Miami. He's been waiting for this game. We all have been for a decade, but Mike has all seven of the guys on, on Miami's defensive line and their three linebackers. He thinks they're all going to the pros, playing in the NFL, and that might be true, but uh, Golik, I will get that done for you if you want. If you want to have some sort of bet, because Mike uh, Ryan strong arms me into bets all the time, and I will absolutely do the same. I will repay him right now. So if you want to make that bet with Mike Ryan, uh, we can get that done right now. I will, get, I will speak on his behalf and get that done right now. My big concern is Golik, how did we allow that? I'm talking to the senior here. How did we allow this to happen? Where Greeny is sitting in the middle of all of this. He has put this entire thing together based off a tweet from one of your listeners. And Greeny has nothing at stake. He has zero at stake here. That's what bothers me about this entire thing. Mike, there are stakes attached to this for you. Golik Jr., there are stakes attached to this for you. There are certainly stakes attached for me. And now Dan Lebitard. Where is Greeny in all of this? What is Greeny doing while all this is going on? This is this is it just goes to demonstrate the enormous power that I wield. So I make an offhand comment. Right. This is the first time this ever happened, years and years and years ago. The Major League Baseball All-Star Game, just follow me on this. The Major League Baseball All-Star Game played in Milwaukee, ended in a tie. The world acted as though this was some travesty. I came on the next morning right here on Mike and Mike, and I said, guys, what do you care? You wouldn't have cared if the American League won. You wouldn't have cared if the National League won. If you really want to make a big deal out of this, give home field advantage into the World Series that leads to the team, the league that wins the All-Star game. The next thing I knew, they did it. I was making an offhand joking remark, and the next thing I knew, it actually happened. So... This week, fast forward 15 years later, I get a tweet, hey, the loser should have to massage Stu Gatz. I just read it aloud. I laugh. It's horrible it. where it's gone. The next thing I know, it happened, it's, and I still don't even know how it happened. It's horrible where it's gone. And by the way, Stu Gatz, you don't yes. have a stake in this. You're getting massaged either way. What do you care? Yeah, You're you a winner win, in all you this. You either way. I mean, I'm going to be mostly naked on TV. There is that. You guys are kind of leaving that part of it out. Like, I'm going to be, uh, like, mostly naked on national TV. Like, okay. that. there is Help something attached it. to me. Yeah. Here's the thing. Yeah. Okay. So when people have asked me this, I made this, this point to go, like, and, and I think that you are the kind of person who will acknowledge this. You live for this. This is exactly your lot in life. Your lot in life, and you, you, and you love it, is to be the one who gets massaged by the loser of the bet, right? That's, that's perfect for you. This is heads I win, tails you lose for Stu Gatz, because either way, you get to be the massagee as opposed to the massager. I, I, would, I would throw back at you that you don't want me to be part of the stakes. You like right. being part of this. Uh, you're, I see Mike Golick Jr. Uh, smiling there because he knows me so well. Uh, Greeny, I think you said yesterday this is my lot in life, and yeah. you nailed it with that. Yes, this is my lot in life. This is where this is where life is taking me. This is where my professional career is taking me. Where yes, I am. Uh, you don't need to ask me if I want to be a part of this. You know I want to be a part of this because yes, I like the attention, and yes, I'm the big winner here. Either way, I'm walking out of this thing with a spa day, so I'm happy. You mentioned that Stu Gatz might have to be kind of nude on air, and since Stu Gatz is like fashions himself a bizarro world, Mike Greenberg. I feel like mm-hmm. we need to get Greeny some skin in this game, so I don't know if we can worry it out, yes. work it out with like whatever the over-under is for this game or anything like that. But if we get to a certain point, I want the Greenberg corollary where if Greeny's portion of this loses, Greeny has to be tastefully nude and maybe in some photo calendar shoot or something like that. Let's get Greeny a little naked on air ah. if Stu Gatz has to be a little naked on air. There's literally zero yeah. chance of that. Uh, I just right. threw this thing out here as a joke, and it took hold. I, 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 I planted right. something, and it grew. I have no this stake is, in th- I'm going to sit back and watch this game well, as relaxed as can be. This is worse well, what do you think of Levitard's suggestion? Well, well hold on. It, it, this is the worst thing ever for you, Golik. I feel bad for you. I, I really do. And I don't want Levitard's hands anywhere near me. So, I, Golik, I need, your, like, I need your hands. I'm sorry to say that. I know that sounds creepy, but I need you to be the one giving me the massage. I do not want Dan Levitard putting his hands all over my glutes, all over my body. I don't want it. So, Golik, it's, it's got to be you. But, Mike, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? Because I think Dan made a very fair suggestion the other day on the air. 
if, you know, if Miami wins, okay, if Miami wins, which means Golik has lost, Golik, you have to massage Mike Greenberg. Greedy, it's a spa day. You should be happy with that. Yeah, I'm and not getting massaged. If, I'm not getting what do you mean you're not getting? It's all the Who same in like a dark a room, man. I'm telling you right now, under no circumstances, in our final week after 18 years, am I letting Golik massage me? Under what a There's way to go out, no huh? No chance of that. Uh, I've done all of the. I've lost all the wages I could possibly lose. You guys took this right. out yourself. There was no reason for this. There was yeah. He's, somehow he's just, you allowed this to happen. Yeah, to no, Mike, I, you, I, Mike, you, Mike, you strong. No, Greeny, you strong armed everyone into this, and you just lobbed my name into it without even consulting me, without asking me. But Greeny, you won't get a massage. I mean, you allow a cow to poop on you, but you won't let Golik put his hands on you? Oh, I, I'll, I'll get a massage under the right circumstances, but I can tell you right now, the man sitting to my left is, <laughs> is by no means that. Let's actually talk about this game. Well, or at least let's talk yes. about... Oh, do you, yeah, yeah, I, I wanted... That, that's why I wanted to go. The game. I, I wanted to talk about Miami and the U. I mean, are we expecting... A, does everybody think they're back? And B, are we expecting, because we've seen it in their heyday, all the alumni that come back uh, and stand on the sidelines. Did you think they're back to where you're going to see this Saturday night? Uh, I, listen, there are still questions as far as I'm concerned as to whether they are back. Because being back for the University of Miami is not just making it to the ACC championship game. It is making it to the national championship game and winning the national championship game. And then doing it again the next year. And then doing it again the next year. That's, that's Miami being back. That's what it was like in the mid-80s, late-80s, into the early 90s. That's what it was like in the early 2000s. So I think even with the win last weekend at home against Virginia Tech, I think there are still questions. And then on the other side of that, Mike, I think Miami really respects. The fans do, the team does, and we do just how good Notre Dame is. That offensive line might be the best offensive line in the country. I think this game will get down to the offensive line versus the defensive line uh, for the University of Miami. Will that Notre Dame offensive line wear them down? Will Notre Dame be able to run the ball? Will Notre Dame have to come from behind, something they really haven't done on the road with a young quarterback, well, an inexperienced quarterback, I should say. So, But as far as the University of Miami being back, it feels good, right? We have a big game, an undefeated Miami team against a one-loss Notre Dame game at home. Uh, it feels, you know, it's something that brings you back to kind of your childhood for all of us, for me, for you, Mike Golick, for you, Greeny. Uh, this was a big rivalry uh, when we were growing up. Uh, it feels like they're back. They're still there's still some questions here. So, but you're going to have all the alumni there. Michael Irvin was on the show yesterday. He delivered a great uh, pregame speech for us. It was awesome. We had Bryant McKinney and Ed Reed coming in today. Ed Reed's going to be on the sidelines there for this Miami game. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. College football needs this. It's great. I'm glad it's back. It's Miami and it's Notre Dame. And it's going to be a fun week. But, Mike, when, when Miami's back, it means Miami is making it to national championship games and winning national championships you know, multiple years. Just getting to an ACC championship game is not enough for me, at least, to say the Canes are back. I do want to ask you a question, Mike, because I think this is interesting. What if Miami loses this game to Notre Dame? What if they lose this game to Notre Dame? And it's a close game. It's a three-point game. It's a four-point game. They lose the game, though. Then go on to the ACC championship game, and they beat Clemson. Does a one-loss Miami team get into the Final Four? Well, I think it's going to have to go to, to, to decide what else happens. Is Wisconsin undefeated? Because we keep wondering if, if a big uh, a Power 5 undefeated gets left out. How good, uh, the winner of Oklahoma TCU, how big is that win, and how good do they run the rest of their table as well? I think they'll have an argument, but, but I think a lot will have to go into the SEC title game. Is that a close game where we keep thinking maybe the loser of that game could be in the Final Four, Mike? Yeah, you win here, you control your own fate, you lose, you don't. You have a chance still going forward, yeah. but you just don't control anything of what happens. I'm just writing down the things that would have to happen in that case, the Alabama-Georgia, first and foremost, the Alabama-Georgia game would have to be, if they both get there unbeaten, and Auburn will have something to right. say about that twice. Yeah. But if they both get there unbeaten, that, I think that game would have to be one-sided. Yeah, you would need only one SEC team to get in to give the, Miami still that chance. I think they take a one loss. Although, you know what, let me, let me stop. Let me stop and not say that. Because they would have to be doing something that they themselves know is, is unprecedented and unusual, and that is taking two teams from one conference into this. Now, I, I know there's only three years of historical precedent that we're dealing in here, but they'd have to be taking two teams from one conference, which they might be a little bit hesitant to do. They might. But Notre Dame gets in for sure under the scenario that Stu Gatz just painted, unless they wind up losing to Stanford, or is it Navy? Is Navy, the Navy and Stanford, yeah. So let's just say for the sake of argument, they wind up winning out. And then you've got the Big Ten and you've got the Big 12. I, I think, Mikey, you said it right. I, th I think the loser, uh, of the winner of the Miami-Clemson game at that point 
still need, well, if, especially if it's Miami, would definitely need help under those circumstances. Does Clemson not need help? Does Cle- if Clemson wins out, are they a lock, Mike Golick Jr.? Yeah, no, they're I a lock. They're yeah. I think they're in. They're a lock. They stay in no matter what happens. I think so, they'll, yeah. be, they'll be in. That loss will be early enough. Stu Gatz, you mentioned uh, the Miami players that you had on this week. You said Michael Irvin yesterday, Ed Reed, and Brian McKinney. Of all the Miami alumni that you think you guys have talked to that are going to be back for this game, which one do you think would have the best shot if we put them on the field this weekend of actually still being able to do it? Oh, wow, that's funny. That's a good question. Uh, Probably Ed Reed, right? He's not that far removed from playing in the NFL. He's maybe the greatest uh, safety of all time uh, in the NFL. I know he's in great shape. I'm looking forward to seeing him today. He's going to be in studio with us at 11 a.m. Eastern. So um, I would say, wow, that's a great question, Mike. Maybe Ed Reed or – because I feel like Ray Lewis can – like just he could sum it up for one day. Ray Lewis can go play a football game today and still give you 15 tackles and maybe a sack or something like that. So I'm going to say like Ray Lewis or Ed Reed, guys who aren't too far removed from the NFL. Michael Irvin's in great shape, but I think Michael Irvin's like 51 at this stage. So uh, I'm not going to go Irvin there. I'm going to go – I'm going to go with Ed Reed. All right, Stu Gatz again today and every day, coast to coast, the Dan Lebertard Show, and looking forward to Notre Dame Miami this weekend with everything in the world at stake. Yep. Uh, Listen, I have a question for Golick because Miami had eight wins last year. I think Notre Dame had four. There is nothing worse than a uh, than a you know than than cocky, condescending Brian Kelly. The only thing that's worse than that is when he has a winning team behind him, which he does right now. Uh, But is Notre Dame back, Mike? Because you asked me if Miami's back, and I would ask you. Is Notre Dame back? I think Miami is closer to being back or was last year and now carrying it forward this year than Notre Dame is. Is Notre Dame back? Are they well, back, Mike? Well, I mean, you, you get. let's see if you get a quarterback. You'll have a quarterback in Brandon Wimbush that will come back next year and you'll actually have a back-to-back quarterback, the same quarterback, two years in a row. You're going to lose the left half of that offensive line, which is a couple of studs who are going to be first-round draft picks. I don't know how much, Mike, they lose on defense. Uh, as well, but that offensive line will take a little bit of a hit. It will, but like back, back again. Like the same standard for back is at both places. You got to win a national title at one of those spots to really bring this thing back yeah. to the pe- level people are going to accept. But I don't think Notre Dame really left as much as people want to make out. Last year, they were in the Fiesta Bowl two years ago before that four and right. eight season. As far as I'm concerned, that four and eight year is sort of the blip. It had been steadily trending, trending up from the time BK got there through the national title appearance year through the Fiesta Bowl year like that and then back to where they are now like at some point you got to look at that four and eight and say that's kind of an anomaly compared to where they've been this is the best of mike and mike podcast mike podcast subscribe now by going to the listen tab in the espn app the best of mike and mike adam Schefter is here our nfl insider extraordinaire Shefty he was one of many who have taped a very nice uh, message to us the other day, and, and one of the things we played it the other day, and one of the things I liked about it was that you reminded the world, and I, I always, I like to take credit for things, but I like other people to do it. I'm the one, we are the ones, but I think it was me in particular who named you, you Shefty. Well, it was amazing because I came on Mike and Mike for the very first time in August of 2009, and right away, I don't know what made Greeny say this, but he goes, we need to give you a nickname. I'm like, okay. And he goes, how about Shefty? And I go, okay. And the next thing I know, I'm walking around the halls of Bristol, and people I've never seen in my life are, hey, Shefty, hey, Shefty, hey, Shefty. And if I had known that the nickname that Greeny would bestow upon me that day would have that much permanence, I would have given it some thought. It was just very nonchalant. Okay, that's the nickname then, and all of a sudden, that nickname stuck. I'm sure there are people that actually think that's your last name and not Shefter. I, I just think it's Shefty. You know, I've had a lot of nicknames over time, and that was not one that I've ever had. It was just given to me on a whim. Yeah. And... To this day, people now call me that. Mm. So I feel very proud uh, of that, among other things. Okay, so th- having said that, but thank you for the nice message. All right, let's get down to business here. Wait, by the way, well, before we get down to business, yeah. so have you gotten all these messages? Like, yeah. what, is there one that really warmed your hearts or stayed with you, one that really impacted you? Well, there've been there. Are, I'm told there were a lot more to come, but the yeah. one, I, I mean, I was excited that Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods did one. With wow. Yeah, that was yeah. nice. Yeah. I mean, I like golf, and so that was a, and he's Tiger. That's pretty nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then Shefty was number two. I mean, yeah, it was okay. Tiger, well, and then it was I Shefty. understand that. <laughs> yeah, and whoever is sitting there that did it, they'll always be number two. It would be Tiger and then Herm. Well, we'll check Jaws back or, next yeah. week yeah. after you see even more messages. Exactly. And we'll see who else shows up on that list. All right, in the meantime. Yes. We got Jerry Jones. We got Roger Goodell. We got Jones versus a bunch of other owners. Yeah. What? I'm giving you the floor. What the heck is going on here? Well, first of all, it's been going on all year long. And – I think Jerry wants to take control of the league. 
I think that he does not want to see Roger Goodell empowered. And what this has really done is it's created a showdown between Roger Goodell and Jerry Jones and Jerry Jones and the Compensation Committee. And Jerry Jones is almost being a maverick on this, leading the charge to try to get Goodell out of there or reduce his salary or have some type of effect. And I was talking with Mort yesterday, and Mort pointed out, and this is exactly right, Jerry Jones' role model was Al Davis. And Al Davis loved to go after the league. And Al Davis didn't like it when the power of the league resided in the league office or with the commissioner. He didn't believe it should be that way. And Jerry Jones now believes the exact same thing. He believes that the owners and maybe even him should be controlling this league, not Roger Goodell. And the league has done any number of things that I think have upset and bothered and irked him to the point now where he's taking matters into his own hand. And I think the compensation committee is going to go ahead and try to get this deal done as it has been trying to do all along. And I think it's going to get done, the extension for Roger Goodell. And I think Jerry Jones is not going to be happy about that extension. And Jerry Jones is going to go fight it. Under what grounds? I don't know, but he's going to. I completely agree with you. I have no idea what this lawsuit thing is about, and I I don't think it's going to go anywhere or has any merit at all. But here's the thing. Jerry Jones is like that guy who is making a statement and then saying, who's with me? Let's go, because you need 24 owners to vote on this thing. If you don't want Roger Goodell in there anymore, how many owners does he have on his side? I, I don't believe he has the number required right now to get Roger Goodell out of there. And I don't think he will get the requisite support that he would need to have Goodell evicted, essentially. Yeah. Um, But there are some people who do support him. There's nobody that feels as strongly about it as Jerry Jones does. He's leading the charge here. Let's make no mistake about it. But he does have some support, just I don't think enough. And again, the compensation committee was empowered to get this deal done. The other people can say, we don't want this deal. Jerry Jones can say, I don't think Roger Goodell is the right man for the job. And it doesn't matter. If Arthur Blank, leading that committee, says, Roger Goodell, here's your five-year extension, that's it. Game over. So they have the power. It doesn't need, they have doesn't that need power. to be this vote we're talking about. Correct. That committee has the power. They can here's extend Goodell. They've been okay. given that power. Okay. And so that's why, to me, it's... It's a lot about power here, right? They have that power. Jerry Jones, as the influential guy that he is, has his power. Right. Roger Goodell has his power. And let's see who's the most powerful people in the room here. So let's take the next step. Yeah. Green and I agree as well, just like you. Roger Goodell is going to get the extension. So, in essence, Jerry Jones is going to lose this fight that he is now screaming from the mountaintops about. So, if that happens, mm-hmm. if it goes like we think, then what happens? Now well, they got to go back to just being owners with this thing. Put aside now, what happens next? Look, look, uh, David Boyes is a lot smarter with the law than I am. I I don't know what steps he has and what steps he can undertake, but I can tell you this, that Jerry Jones is not going quietly into the night. He's not just going to accept this. Now, I don't know what recourse he has and what he can do and what his attorney can do, but I I don't think they're wasting their own time for the fun of it. They they feel like they have grounds to challenge this in some way. I, I don't know what that is. I'll be curious, but it's creating... A fuss, and it's just, it's been the kind of season that this whole year has been. Like, people going at it, uh, fights on the field, fights off the field, battles, legal battles. Everything's about lawyers, lawyering up. The anthem, it's just been a very strange deal. You know what? And the whole thing, the whole thing is just having a negative impact on the NFL. It's not good for the game. It's not good for the sport. It's turned off a lot of people, and the league has nobody but itself to blame. Mike and Mike Shefty is in the room. I think we all agree on that. But let's go then to what we were saying a moment ago. You know Goodell probably even better than we do. We know him reasonably well. But I don't know him well enough to know the answer to this question. What is the point at which he might say, I've made hundreds of millions of dollars, which by any one standard is enough to live on for the rest of your life and, and everything else. What do I need this for? Do I want to sign a contract extension when I know that, A, one of the most powerful guys in the room has tried to stage a coup, B, he has the support of some of the other owners. We don't know exactly how many, but some, and C, I'm staring at a lot more headaches coming up. This, this you know, kneeling controversy isn't going away anytime soon. Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, CTE issue isn't going away anytime soon. The ri- dip in television ratings is a major problem and concern, and who knows where it's coming from, and clearly they don't know exactly what to do about it. Where is the point at which you could realistically 
quickly see him saying, I don't need this anymore. There have been people that have asked that question, and it's not all of a sudden now that Jerry Jones is challenging him. I've been hearing that for the last couple of months, really since these questions first began to be raised. And I haven't gotten any indication or answer that this is the time that Roger would step away. Look, he, he has never done anything else but work in the NFL. Now, there have been people who suggested in the past they could see him going into politics and making a run. I don't know whether that's uh, in Washington or representing the state of New York. Um, His father was a senator, for correct. those who don't know. Yeah. And, and, and there were people who thought that he could go that route. And look, he's made enough money that he could do whatever he wants, and he doesn't need this. But I, I, I don't know. It's a great question. People have wondered it. I don't have the answer to explain it to you right now. You know, listen, he'll probably be on this radio show before, well, you guys won't even be here. So that's, that's a moot point. I'll tell it to you and Trey. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he may, I, I mean, he, he, the, so do you think that won't even come to, see, I, I'm thinking that we got one more week. Like yeah. something's got to happen in this week, right? I mean, this, this, this thing, which he's, Jerry Jones is threatening something by Friday, which is tomorrow. Like, something's got to happen this well, week. Well, I, I think we're at a critical juncture. I think the compensation committee is going to push through this deal. I think it's just going to push the, through the, the deal. And is that Soon. a big sticking it to Jerry? They're just basically saying, you know, because these are all billionaires. We are, this is a, a I, you know, listen, We it, all know it, what contest this is. It's partly sticking it to Jerry, but it's partly doing exactly what that committee has set out to oh, do so all it, along. And it's been delayed and derailed in large part because of Jerry's contributions to being an ad hoc member on that committee, which he was never appointed to be, but – Basically, now he's not an ad hoc sure, member Now he anymore. stepped back from that. <laughs> Again, Jerry does what he wants to do. Yeah. But the majority of the owners, you think, still are, are firmly yes. behind Goodell regardless I'm not of. i firmly. Okay, I think he's got firm support from the people he needs it from. But I cannot tell you that he's got firm support across the board from a majority I, of the owners. I bet it's like we're better off with this and then instead of trying to change to something Who's the new. successor, by the way? Right. Let's just exactly. say we're getting well, rid we of Roger Goodell. We were yeah, talking we threw that about out. that this morning. Yeah, yeah I don't know. There, there's nobody that you could think of. I've heard a couple of names bandied about. I threw out the name Amy Trask. Amy Trask. And hi. Um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she would tweet, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, l- listen, I love Amy. She's great. I, I, I have Someone I with a background she's... in the sport, a background I, in the business of the sport. I think it's going to be an in-house person again. But who's that? Just, they they I groomed I, I, Goodell I, for 30 years. I don't years. know. I don't know. Now, the guy that I, that I think would be compelling, and it's a name that most people are not even going to know, Joe Lucessi. He's an attorney in New York City. Uh, he's done a lot of work for the league. Um, very well liked, very well respected. Could see that being a guy. You, do you know him? No, no I don't. No, I have no. to admit, that's not no, a name no. that yeah. I know. So, yeah. All right, so we'll see. Uh, it, it, now we're getting into that. But the, the bottom line of it is this thing has taken a turn, and there's got to be some resolution to it relatively quickly, and then we'll see where the chips all fall. The best of Mike and Mike. Wait, hold on. What? They told me uh, I'm here. So all right, we are Mike and Mike, and our sports center is brought to you by CT Shirts. Time to upgrade your wardrobe with CT Shirts, the most exquisitely crafted British-styled crease-free shirts you'll ever wear. One CT shirt normally costs 100 bucks, but we'll get you three for just $99. Go to ctshirts.com slash Mike. That's ctshirts.com slash Mike. Okay, here we go. All of you with us on ESPN2, you're seeing it. Golik has just removed the gloves. Wow. You are the gloves. That's, wow. That's a stupid Come This on. is hilarious. You dip your fingers in that sauce? Thing. We saw a video of Shaq, Travis Kelsey, Greg Olson. None of them had gloves on. I'm not wearing the gloves. Is this because of legal? Shaq? Is this because of legal? Yeah, this is wow. fighting legal. Back illegal. legal. <laughs> so, some of them did, actually. Yeah. I, I'm almost positive Greg Olson did. But either he did. way, he did. here's what's going to happen. So these guys all have these Carolina Reaper pepper uh, chips, the one chip challenge. You've seen it all over the place. And these guys are going to do it. Let me read you some quick tweets here. Um, MC tweets, I bet Golik is out in two minutes. <laughs> Robert uh, is tweeting about the milk. Ross tweets, the, the rule is last person to puke or take a drink of milk is the winner of the challenge. Oh. There are no winners. Well, no. Oh, there no. are no oh, winners. No. There are only degrees of losing. So that's enough. fine. So you guys are going to take <clears throat> me all then. Okay, so no. if you guys would unwrap your chips, I'm going to step away. <laughs> Again, I don't, don't want like to be Just so people coffin. know. I'm getting rid of the stunt chips. You know, cute. Okay. Right, here we go. Oh, wait stunt. a minute. It's in a little bag. Oh, yeah. wow. It comes in a bag in a coffin. They're in a bag. Yeah, the oh, Golik just opened the bag with his mouth and look at his face. You are really oh dumb. Oh my God, you're this. You is, continue to woo. do this stuff dumber than anyone else. Have we eaten them yet? Look at his face. So, so when do we look at Golik's face already? No, we're going to do it all at once. I'm going to give you. A oh man, yo, it Let's is get everybody that is pungent, dude. How I does am, it smell? That's got some stink. I'm holding it down here. I, 
I can't open. I, are you I, serious? How do you guys feel? Oh, suddenly he's wearing the gloves. Yeah. Right, Not such a big man, are you How quick anymore? those gloves went on. All right, Why I'm do you say my mud chip is way bigger than Oh, will you just it's stop? Not, it's it's listen, you know what? It's all on body mass. It's not about the size of the chip, It's not about the size of the chip, all right? We're going to get a 3 2 one from the entire room. Everybody together. All chip. Three, two, one. There they go. All right, Golik's got his in. D Wood's got his in. Mikey's got his. Trey's still holding out. Go ahead, Trey. Come on. There he goes. Okay. He's in. Let's see. I will do play-by-play for the radio audience. The television audience on ESPN2 should have a full understanding of what's going on. No problem. Let me duck under the cameras here. And let's see. Golik, how do you feel? Guys, let me hear how you're feeling. Uh, it's gone. The chip is gone. Yep, it's gone. <sighs> Mikey, you look a little out the of it. chip's gone. Okay. D. Wood, how about you? Are you not in? Are you not in today? Okay, I'm good. Is this now a competition? Who's going well, for the milk first? From what I what I've seen, it's, it, it hits Woo. you later. So I'm, okay, I'm it's, feeling right now. It, it's starting it to warm up. Now. Oh, it's getting there. It's I, starting to warm up. Yo, oh, <laughs> I see Golik's face. My mic's <laughs> on the table. Mikey, you're right. Don't touch your face. Whatever I think you I already touch touched it. I might go blind. Right. Golik is going questions? to the milk. Can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. What's the big deal? <sighs> What's the big deal? Did you really eat it or did you did you put the no, chips are there? Oh. How you doing, man? I think I touched my good. eye. Big wood. I'm, I am good, baby. Oh, they have I'm not good. gotten near the so, so so far, Mikey has had some milk. Golik, your eyes are very red. Very red. Yeah. How, how do you how would you describe what's going on right now? <laughs> Yo. It's heating up a little bit. You can teach. You can take off your gloves, and then you can touch your face, right? Take the gloves off, and then you can touch your face. Mike, Mike, the Golics are really dripping now. There's a lot of water coming out of their Man. faces. It's just it won't stop. It's so hot. <laughs> Can't stop, won't stop. M- Mikey, yeah, yeah. Mikey is almost uh, <laughs> like, like wobbling a little. D. Wood is staying strong. And Trey, I don't know what's, what's going on. What's the big deal, I ask you? Trey, did oh. you actually eat? The- okay, now there we <sighs> No, that was a joke. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going for the milk. I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm taken aback by Trey right now. This is stunning. I am as well. <clears throat> Hold D. on. Wood, how about you? D. Wood, Hold you on. look all right. Dude, I'm, uh-oh. I'm good. You know what it is? When you breathe, it's still in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and Mikey is going to the, to the full container of milk. <laughs> Golik is eating bread. He's wiping his face with bread. D. Wood, you're hanging in there. Look at Damian Woody. He's just standing strong. Brother. No, trust me. My legs are shaking right now. <laughs> it, Mike Golick, uh, yeah. Sr., you did that ghost pepper. How does this compare to that? It's hotter. This is hotter. It's hotter. <sighs> it's hotter. Again, I ask, what's the big deal? I don't understand how, what's ha- I don't understand how Trey is, looks like the way he looks and the Golicks look the way they look. Hold I- on a minute. All right. Are there varying levels of these? Did he get a, <clears throat> a less? P- I did throw away the stunt chips. I want to be clear. But no, I'm all right. That's impressive. Damien. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Damien, I think I'd like another one. <laughs> his eyes are Damien, watering. His eyes are starting to water. Can I get another one? He looks like he wants a hug. I'd like another one. Uh, Trey is asking Yo, for another one. We can get him another one. You're a real one, man. Let me be uh, clear. I'm not that stupid. Okay, fair enough. Damien is the realest one I've ever met. Bro, yeah. talk Bro. to me, d Tell me how you're feeling right now. <sighs> Bro, like... My legs feel like they're about to leave me. Right? Okay. It's, oh, I'm, hold, I'm holding on strong right now. Come on, big one. Come on. You got to move. You got to move. Come on. Come on. Come on, baby. You got to move. You got to move. I got no. I'm feeling it, baby. I, I, there's part of me that doesn't think Trey didn't need it. I ate the fucking chip. Did I swear on air? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you did. You did, yeah. but you're all right. You did, but you're okay. Woo. That's what the dump button's for. Yeah. Man, that thing, that, like, punched you in right in the mouth. i got snot bubbles. Is it, is it starting to, uh, is it start- well, it's starting to wear off I, I now? Think, I, think, I think the issue is you never lived through the 90s with Chumbawamba. I get knocked down. I get back up again. Man, that's what it is. There is are that, paper towels on the cancer. floor. No, no that, paper towels, is that no milk, Is that all nothing. they got? That's the best they got. Come on, baby, let's go. They got, that's uh, the best uh, they got, huh? He did it again, by the way. That's why, <laughs> man. <laughs> Welcome to our future. It's so hot. Milk was I'm a bad choice. With Damien and Trey. I am. I'm a coward. Are you not entertained? Go look, talk to me. I, I, <sighs> I'm looking at you. My mouth is on fire. What, no. what, what's the matter with you guys? No, no, so now the burning's moved on to my eyelids. Like my actual eyelids 
or on Your fire. eyelids are cinched? No, like, yeah, like my, the inside yeah. of my eyelids. Damien, I'm taken aback by your reaction. I've never seen anyone have quite as, as placid a reaction as the one that you're having. Well, here's the thing. Because I'm right of, here. Because of, because I'm of, right here. I'm a tray as well. Because of my body mass, I'm, a, I'm able to absorb, like, So, heat. again, can I get a little credit here? Because I'm one-third of him. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Trey, I, explain this brother. to me. How do you guys explain Trey? Well, I don't I, know. I'm amazed at I Trey. went to school in Texas. We had a lot of jalapenos. In fact, this is a shout-out to my guy Dan, my college friend, uh, who would literally order five extra jalapenos and eat them just one at a time and would not flinch. When I this is for him. The sauce, the other, yeah, whatever the heck I ate that the last ghost time. ghost peppers. It really went down the gullet. This is just sticking in my mouth and my face. It's on fire. It's not going away. Hold on a minute. It's minute. now in my how nose. Was that, how was that coating? Because you, you ate. You guys ate. So how was that holding? How did it look like it held up? <laughs> <laughs> not well. People really threw up because of this? M- many times. <laughs> many times. Okay. Whatever. Well, I got to say, everybody, how about a round of applause for this group? <laughs> it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of courage. Are you going to be all right? Yeah, I felt that. Sorry about swearing, Skipper. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? What else you got? Uh, let me just say to the Packy people, as Lawrence Taylor once said to uh, Ken O'Brien when he sacked him as he was mic'd up for a preseason game against the Jets, son, you all got to do better than this. Oh, wow. wow. Mm. Hey, Wingo, dropping mm. the mic. And we will as well. Thank you, everybody, for spending this morning with us. And we'll see you back in Better Than Ever tomorrow. Behold the glory!